Okay, so for some of our friends that just joined, we are, um, Patty has put a link to the home base in the chat. Um, that document has links to all the information that you will need today. And right now we are um, putting our name in the um, introduction section and we are writing a personal learning goal for today. Okay, so it looks like we're doing really well on that. Um, again, for this, um, first we're gonna talk about um, the foundations of PBIS and kind of across those tier one, tier two, tier three. We're gonna dive a little bit into those foundational beliefs of the UDL framework. And then we're going to talk about the restorative practices cornerstones. And that those will be the three areas that we are covering today. So still on that same um, home-based document, I see some of you are already doing that. If you wouldn't mind letting us know what brought you here today, what aspect of this series kind of appealed to you? So please feel free to type that into the um, home-based document.
right? I love reading those. It's very interesting, you know, because this is such a, this is such, you know, we've got three very key cornerstones that are part of education today with PBIS, UDL, and restorative practices. And some of you have knowledge in one, but maybe not the other or this one or that one. And so you're really here to expand your learning, which is absolutely fantastic. So we appreciate that. Okay, so now I am going to attempt, I don't promise that it's going to work, is I, we're gonna do a little um, Zoom poll and I want you to um, share on here, uh, what is your knowledge? on these different areas, okay? So hopefully it works. Launching it. All right. Here you go. Can you guys see it? Yes? Okay, yay! All right. Oh, crud. Did I have four questions on there? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, the last one just said like choice one, choice two. I think it just was an unfinished one, but it's all good. You got through these four sessions, you all will realize that I am the queen of like messing up at least one thing during a session. <laughs> like, I don't know. Oh my gosh. That is so funny. Well, hey, but 69% of you said yay to choice one. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. So here we go. Is it, has everybody had a chance now? Yeah. Okay. So let's share these results, shall we? Can you see them? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, so familiarity with PBIS. 90% of you are very familiar with PBIS. This is really helpful for us because then we kind of know the pace that we can go through some of this information because again, we don't want you to sit there going, oh my gosh, we know this, what? You're wasting our time, right? So this is really a good way for us to gain your back, understand your background knowledge in these areas. Okay, restorative practices. We're kind of split on this, right? We have about 53% know that it's being implemented in the district. Um, four of us are the leader of restorative practices. Eight of us are like, I've heard of it. 100% comfortable with it, okay? So that's kind of good information to know too. And then the last one, where are we at with UDL? Ha <laughs> ha, it's not the first time everybody's heard of it. So that warms my heart. <laughs> um, and about, again, about a little, half and, a little over half and half, right? I've heard of it, it is being implemented or I'm the leader. Jennifer, get out of the way, I'm gonna teach this for you. So that really kind of helps us understand, you know, how much we need to dive into this information and how much we can just kind of like quickly go through some of it. So thank you very much for um, participating in our, in our poll. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Patty. All right, so I am in a room full of PBIS experts, it seems, which is great. Um, what I intend to do today is, um, kind of do an overview. So for those of you who are very familiar with this, sort of think of this like a little recap of all the things that should be going on um, on your campuses and um, within your district if you're implementing PBIS. For the 10% of you that are brand new to this, 
Um, know that our expectation is not for you to walk away knowing fully how to implement PBIS. Um, that's something that takes between one and three years to really learn how to do and get good at. Um, but this will give you a nice foundation of understanding what some of the core components of PBIS are. Um, and hopefully it'll motivate you to want to seek out some additional in-depth training and support from your local technical assistance center to get it going um, in your district or on your campuses. So PBIS, as most of you know, is a framework um, for enhancing the adoption and implementation of a continuum of evidence-based practices um, that are really intended to support not only academic, but social, emotional, and behavioral outcomes. And PBIS is intended to be used and implemented with all students on a campus. So not just your general education students, not just students who may be having some challenges um, in uh, one or more of these areas, but really all of the students on a campus are intended to um, be recipients of and benefit from PBIS. It is a multi-tiered system of supports. Um, and so you all are, I'm sure, very familiar with um, what that actually means and looks like. Um, the tier one universal interventions um, are put in place for all students and are intended to really prevent the need for additional or more intensive services and do so for about 80% of our students. Um, tier two secondary targeted small group interventions um, are put in place when the tier one interventions haven't maybe been enough for um, 10 to about 15% of our students who need something just a little bit more, a little bit more intensive. And then our tier three intensive or individualized interventions um, usually are reserved for those students who have the most intensive needs. Um, and that's generally about one to 5% of our population. Next slide. The purpose of PBIS is to make uh, the school learning environment uh, more effective and equitable for everyone. Um, it creates predictable, consistent, and positive um, safe environments so that students can really uh, do their best learning um, and, and benefit from everything that school has to offer. Next slide. So this slide sort of encompasses the core elements of PBIS. Um, at the center, of course, you see equity, uh, which is central to all of the work that we do. We want to make sure that all students are um, accessing and getting equitable access to everything that schools have to offer. And we do this by implementing evidence-based practices. Um, and those are the things that the students receive from everyone on the campus um, to really derive uh, the benefit um, of school. The systems are the things that are put in place to support the adults in delivering those practices effectively. And the data are what we use to be able to know what students need, when they need it, and if they're benefiting from the practices that we're putting in place. Um, we also use data to know if the adults are implementing the things, the practices, um, in the way that they were intended so that students can derive that benefit. Next slide. Uh, PBIS is one of the most well-researched um, and well-studied um, school-wide interventions. Um, and you can see by this slide that um, the research tells us that PBIS is effective across a variety of different areas. We see improved student outcomes with academics, social-emotional competence, um, as well as reduce, uh, reduce reduction in bullying. Um, decreases in rates of students reported drug and alcohol use. Um, of course, we see improvements in terms of exclusionary discipline. Um, and there are also improved teacher outcomes. And one of the things I think it's important to point out is um, teacher retention and job satisfaction is increased whenever they're um, supported in implementing a system like PBIS. Next slide. And we know that PBIS really is um, a, a, a practice that can um, improve equity outcomes, not only for Hispanic and Black students, which this slide clearly indicates um, improves their um, participation and, um, and access to school, but also students with disabilities. Um, when schools are implementing PBIS, um, all students benefit. Next slide. So I'm going to do a very brief 
um, kind of tour of the tiers, just to review um, for everyone um, what the core components um, are at each of the tiers of PBIS um, so that you guys can kind of take account of what it is that you're doing, um, maybe some things you want to revisit, but really to establish a foundation for you to think about how universal design for learning, as well as restorative practices, can be integrated into and build upon the really strong foundation that PBIS puts in place when it's implemented. So we're gonna start with tier one. This slide summarizes the systems, data, and practices that are part of uh, tier one or universal or primary PBIS implementation. Um, and when we're implementing PBIS, we're wanting to make sure that all of these things are being done as intended or with fidelity. When we implement things with fidelity, then we have a higher probability of getting the outcomes that the research say we should be getting. So on the left-hand side, you see a summary of the systems and data that PBIS puts in place. And on the right-hand side, you see the core tier one practices. Next slide. Something to keep in mind with tier one um, is that the data that we're looking at with tier one is putting, putting the core features and practices in place. We're really assessing to make sure that students are benefiting. And when we're identifying certain times of the day or certain contexts or certain situations where we have a high percentage of students who are struggling, let's say that it's the transition in from lunch or um, the transition um, into the locker room um, for PE. We have a high percentage of students that are exhibiting some challenges during those time periods. Um, that indicates that we need to look at it from a systems perspective and change something that we are doing in order to support the students during that time period. Um, we would consider that a universal support and a universal intervention or consideration um, if there's more than 10% of students that are having a challenge during a particular situation, as opposed to pulling out those 10 students and trying to do something individualized for them. Um, so tier one data and tier one systems are about putting in place things that really benefit all students. And the data we're looking at um, are during those times where we're seeing a high percentage of students that are maybe, maybe struggling and troubleshooting and putting in place or intensifying some of the interventions during those times. Next slide. All right, so what are those practices that we put in place in tier one? Um, the first one is to establish a school-wide set of positively stated expectations. We see a couple of examples here. Um, and these are the things that we want all students and all staff to really um, learn how to do and exhibit in, in all of the different school contexts. Um, I hope you notice that on the left-hand side, the language is very inclusive, and that's going to become really important when you think about your implementation of um, Tier 1 PBIS. We are respectful. We are responsible. We are kind that we language is really demonstrating that it's for everyone and it's all inclusive. Next slide. Those expectations are then broken down um, and the skills that we want students to exhibit um, across all of the different settings um, and all of the different contexts of the school day um, are then identified by the school site team. Um, hopefully that school site team is inclusive of a variety of different voices, including student and family voices. Um, this is an example of a teaching matrix that's broken down the three um, school-wide expectations of we are responsible, respectful, and safe across a variety of different contexts or settings with those expectations clarified for everyone. Next slide. Those expectations are then systematically taught and reviewed on a regular basis um, and taught hopefully in a way that all students can access the learning. And I'm gonna plant a little seed there to think about when Jen goes into universal design for learning, um, how we go about teaching these expectations and making sure that the, that the learning is accessible to all students is really key so that everyone can benefit. Next slide. Posters should then be posted um, around um, the school to remind not only students, but also staff what the expectations are in each of the environments. 
Um, and this is a, a practice um, that can also really be thought about in terms of accessibility for all students. How these posters are presented um, really is key in making sure that they're being utilized most effectively. Next slide. Once we've identified and taught the expectations, then we put in place acknowledgement systems. And acknowledgement systems are really key because they reinforce the expected behaviors. Um, and they're designed really to, um, to, to make sure that everyone who's engaging in appropriate behavior is being recognized for it so that that behavior continues to increase across the campus. Next slide. Um, the goal is for there to be more positive interactions with students than corrective um, or negative interactions um, with students and between students. So we aim to get all staff on campus using that acknowledgement in a five to one ratio, five positive interactions per every one corrective or, um, or, or redirection that's being given to students. And acknowledgement systems often involve the use of some type of ticket or token um, as a way of being able to recognize and identify student behavior. Um, this is a way of, in, in some ways, collecting data on how frequently students are being acknowledged, but also it adds that little bit of extra incentive um, because these students are then exchanged for other types of rewards that students on that campus find most valuable. And another little plug for UDL and for you guys to think about, not every kid and not every campus is going to value the same thing. So those acknowledgement tickets and what they are traded in for or exchanged for really needs to be considered when you're designing and implementing your PBIS Tier 1 system. Next slide. And the final component of Tier 1 is really thinking about and defining those unwanted behaviors and determining as a campus what types of behaviors are to be managed by staff versus which ones raise to the level of needing an office referral or to be managed through an administrator or, um, or site principal. So the definition of those unwanted behaviors and really defining based on the culture of the campus and based on um, the student population, what those behaviors are, who's gonna be managing them, staff or administrator, and the next slide, identifying then a continuum of responses to those behaviors um, and making sure that everyone knows what those responses to those behaviors um, should be um, is a key component of that tier one implementation. Next slide. All right, moving really fast um, because I know you guys all know this. Um, but tier two are the targeted or group interventions. Keep an eye on my time. Um, and tier two, something really important to consider is that kids aren't tier two kids. Kids have tier two needs sometimes. And that variability exists across all learners. Um, I may be really good at certain things and need some additional support in other areas. And students are gonna be the same way. So tier two, um, is not a student, it's an intervention that a student might receive in an area of need. And that's a, an important consideration when you're thinking about your tier two interventions. Go ahead. So tier two data systems and practices. Um, the data is what tells us if a student is needing something more than what's offered at tier one. And when the data indicates a student needs something more, um, then they are identified to receive an additional intervention. And those interventions can range. In fact, Jen, if you wanna skip forward a couple of slides, right there, whoop, back one, there it is. Um, this is an example of some of the tier two interventions um, that you may have being implemented at your school sites. Um, so you might have some group interventions going on for social skills, for academics. You may have some counseling groups going on um, for different needs, like um, maybe um, a, a group that is um, struggling with how to make friends. There might be a friendship group on campus. Um, you may be implementing check-in, check-out, probably mo the most widely implemented tier two intervention. Um, or there may be some groups that are receiving some interventions around attendance and attendance improvement. 
And then finally, finishing the tour of the tiers, tier three are those intensive individualized interventions. Um, and these are available to students who, in addition to tier one and tier two, might have more extensive needs um, and really could benefit from an individualized, more intensive intervention. Um, sometimes this might include one-on-one um, -on -one counseling. Sometimes it might include, include um, an individualized behavior support plan or something like that. Um, if it's more intensive than that, we may bring in community uh, partners in order to support not only the student, but the family and some of the community needs that um, are going on as well. And Jen, if you want to skip forward to the last slide there, right here. Back one. Thank you. All right. So how is PVIS continually relevant in this constantly changing educational landscape? The reason we want to wanted to offer PBIS as the foundational piece. Number one is because it is the most widely implemented school-wide educational initiative in our state. Um, we have over 2,300 schools in California implementing PBIS um, as of today's date. Um, and over 1,800 of them are actually doing it at least um, at tier one with Fidelity, meaning they've got all of those essential features happening at tier one really strongly. Um, PVIS helps to organize and integrate um, your systems and your data. And it's a really solid foundation to be able to then layer in some of these other initiatives and practices. Um, so we're offering it as kind of the foundational element that you can build your universal design for learning into, as well as your restorative practices into. Um, in a really effective and efficient way. So I think what we're gonna do now is um, send you guys into a, a brief little breakout room. Um, it's gonna be about five or six minutes um, to meet some other people from around the state um, who have a common interest um, in learning how to integrate PBIS, UDL, and restorative practices. And what we want you to just spend a couple of minutes doing is just telling the other people in your group where you're at with your PBIS implementation. Um, are you just starting? Have you been doing it for a while? Um, yeah, are you implementing it at multiple sites within your district? Um, and which tiers have you been able to implement? Um, you could also share some of the challenges or things that have helped you be successful. So Jen's going to put everybody in the breakout rooms. Yes, and there's also space on that home-based document to record your answers so that other people can kind of see that they're not alone in this implementation phase. All right, so five minutes in there, you guys. back. Hopefully you have enough time to run and grab some more water or whatever you need to refresh because we are going to dive into universal design for learning. And I saw on the home base somebody put um, they are a UDL nerd and uh, you are speaking my love language right now because so am I. I could talk UDL all day long. So we are going to talk about how we can leverage the UDL framework in supporting um, PBIS. And I know a lot of times in education, right? We're like, oh my gosh, it's one more thing. Oh, don't tell me I have to do UDL and PBIS and restorative practices. No, you do not. You get to blend your knowledge of the three of them together to make it work for all kids. Right. So that's the important takeaway. OK, so as we were doing this, I was like, you know, I have a lot of UDL people that already. That are in my group here. So if you would like to just jot down your UDL definition in the chat. If you are comfortable, how would you define UDL? If you're not 100% comfortable and you're not 100% sure exactly what it is, that's okay. You do not have to answer the question. 
But you can find on the home base document and on the slideshow, these are three resources that you can use to kind of develop your own definition of UDL. So for right now, my experts in the field, how do you define universal design for learning? Feel free to type it in the chat or heck, you can unmute if you wanna exercise your vocal cords today. Anybody? All right, here we go. Oh, now we're cooking it. Took you a minute to type. See, I'm just not even thinking right. My goodness, tell me, slow my roll. Say, Jennifer, slow your roll. We're getting there. All right, so it is a means by which we allow students and teachers to provide targeted opportunities for differentiation. UDL considers all learning modalities in planning and provides ideas and solutions for any unforeseen barriers. UDL is creating access to all learners through multiple pathways. Um, learning, the instruction and the environments are designed to mitigate barriers and increase access for everyone. UDL is a model for learning that makes starting accessible to all learners, but also places no limits on depth and enrichment that can even an advanced learner can gain from. I love this. It's a way to support students and support learning through different avenues, right? It's a way to understand that you can teach in multiple ways and students are gonna learn in multiple ways and it helps us remove those barriers. Oh my gosh, you guys could totally teach this course. What? Look at that. Look at that. Oh, the use of research-based practices. We love evidence-based practices, Greg. Thank you very much. Appreciate that, right? We use those practices to address the variability of our students and help minimize those barriers. Awesome. You see, you guys know what you're doing. Oops. So people Oops. Ask me all the time. We don't want Katie Novak to talk to us right now. All right. We're not gonna do that because you guys are already on top of it. What I wanted to talk about first is the brain science behind it. And I think sometimes we forget this piece about um, the, universe, the universal design for learning framework. It is based on brain science. They didn't just randomly go, oh, this is what'll be good for kids. And they threw it onto a piece of paper and said, have at it. No, they actually did a lot of research on how the brain learns. And what they noticed is that there are three networks in our brain that help us learn. And for true learning to take place, all three networks have to be engaged at the same time. Okay, remember how we used to think like, oh, well, you're left-brained or you're right-brained and your left brain is doing the work and your right brain, no, no, no. That, that, is not, that is not the way we think about brains anymore. We know that there are the three networks. And we also know that their brains are very unique. So the way, the things that make my three networks fire up and engage me in learning are gonna be different than Patty's that are gonna be different than Marcy's. Right, so these three networks talk about the three parts of our brain. So in the back of our brain, right, that's where we're going to perceive our information and it's going to come into us. So like, how do we best understand the information coming in, right? That's that, that's that affective network. No, not the affective. That's kind of the, the what of learning. What do I need in order to learn? And then the center of our brain is where that amygdala lives, right? And that's that emotional part of learning because we know that learning is very emotional. And I am a big proponent of understanding why. I think it frustrates my boss a little bit because I'm always saying, why? Why, why are we having this meeting? 
Because if I don't understand why, I'm not invested in it. And our kids are that way too. And the why also kind of, if we know why we're doing something, we're less likely to have the anxiety and to have the stress because our amygdala, you know, that's hiding in the center isn't like all flipped out and like stressing out and causing our panic attacks. So our, our amygdala is protected. And then of course we have our frontal lobe right? That organizational piece. So we have to figure out how is our brain going to not only take in the information, but then how are we going to organize it? And that's that that executive functioning, right? All of you that teach students, right? You know, executive functioning, they just, it's a struggle. It's a struggle for adults sometimes, right? So it's that, how can I organize that information how can I then apply that information, right? It's one thing to take it in and understand why we're taking it in, but it's another thing to actually be able then to apply it to something else, right? And so that's what we talk about. We talk about those three networks. We talk about how the way that they're gonna interact with each other is different in every kid, which leads us to that variability. Everybody is different. Every brain is special. Every student is special and everybody has strengths. So we look at it from that acid base lens, not the deficit based. It's not what they can't do. It's what they can do. So when we think about universal design for learning, we think of three areas. We think about clear, rigorous goals. We anticipate barriers based on the variability of our students and our learners, our adult learners too. And we think about design options. So the first thing I'm gonna talk about is those goals. Do we have a very clear goal, right? Again, that goes into that why. Like, why have we decided to form this group, right? We're all part of some group, I don't know, pick a group that we have in our county offices, in our districts. That why, why did we form that group, right? It needs to have a very clear goal, a very clear purpose, right? It needs to be flexible, meaning we're not all gonna achieve that goal in the same way or at the same time. So we have to be super flexible about that. But we also wanna be challenged, right? There's no more dumbing it down. We always used to say, I'll just dumb it down, right? No, we're not dumbing anything down. We're keeping it rigorous, but we're giving them opportunities to digest that information in their own way. Okay, so that's dealing with the goals. The next one we're gonna talk about is anticipating those barriers based on the variability of our students, which means we really need to get to know our learners in order to anticipate those barriers. So when we think about that, we need to start remembering what do we know about learning? right? We know now you can learn in multiple ways. You get information from multiple sources, right? So what do we need to know? We know that, you know, this is important, that is important, this is as needed, this is what's needed or not needed. And then we think about like what stops the learning? What is getting in the way of that learning? So if we are talking about adult learners and we are trying to, um, talk about equity, right? Equity is super hard. Or we're talking about PBIS and we're trying to get our people, our teams involved in PBIS. What might stop their learning? What's gonna be a barrier? Not a clear goal. Like the clear purpose is not given. What stops their learning? They're not maybe understanding the whole process, right? That's going to stop their learning. Like, wait, there's three tiers. Wait, we're doing what? Wait, why are we doing that? Wait, what's happening, right? That confusion could do it. So what it asks you to do is to really think about that. You guys know your staff. You know the adults you're working with, just like teachers know their students, right? They can almost guarantee what is going to stop learning. I remember when I was um, supporting elementary teachers, right, fractions. Fractions seem to be a huge barrier for kids. What stopped that learning of fractions? It's like, okay, I can recognize a freshman, but wait, now I have to like divide fractions? Wait, what just happened, right? What was the, what was the barrier there? 
How can we anticipate that so that we can minimize it so that they can keep learning? I like to call them little speed humps, right? We're not gonna completely stop learning, but we're gonna slow it down just enough to help them get over the hump and then away we go. So that's the variability piece. So when we think about the predictability of variability, we need to really think about how learners will engage with the learning, okay? How are they going to do that? Well, they're gonna do that through a clear understanding of why we are doing this. We're gonna make sure that, um, that we have minimized any distractions, any threats. This is a collaborative group. We're working together. We're gonna to value all voices. We need to think about how will they perceive the information? Right? How are they going to take all of this information in? And then how are they going to act on their understanding? Right? How are they going to be able to apply their understanding? So then when we think about our design options, we go into that even more. So when we think about how will they engage in their learning? So when we think about teaching the PBIS rules, right? can they do it within a group? Do they have a choice of how they're going to do it? Like the content, do, did the students actually have a voice in coming up with the rules? That's their content. Or did you, or did the adults say, well, here's our school rules. Well, wait, I'm like a sixth grader, right? I'm at the top of the food chain at elementary school. Finally, I want a voice in those rules because those don't apply to me. And then collaboration too. How are we working together? Like Patty said earlier, how are we bringing in our family is into our and our communities into this PBIS process? Or have we not? What's the barrier there? Why haven't we done that? Okay. Next, as we're teaching these, do we have options for them to understand the learning? Are there video options, text options? Can they explore it on themselves? Do we have visual cues? because maybe I'm an EL student and I don't understand exactly what this poster is telling me. So is that accessible? Are my posters, are my rules accessible to my kids? I don't know. And then the third one too is, how are they going to apply that knowledge? How are they going to show you they understand the rules? Is there just one way for them to demonstrate understanding? Can they do it by themselves? Can they do it collaboratively? Do they have to actually write something out or can they just tell you, yeah, this is what the rule means? Great, woohoo, done, okay? So really be thinking about how we can minimize those barriers for all of our learners because not all students are gonna read the same, right? Not all cultures are gonna understand the rules in the same way. The way that I grew up in the Midwest is not the way that Californians grew up. And sometimes I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a California thing. That is not a North Dakota thing. So we have to factor into that, right? So we need to think about having clear expectations and making them public, right? Do our parents know about our PBIS? Do they understand the rules and why we came up with that, right? Is there relevance in this? Or are we just creating rules or are the kids like, no, I can, I can see how that applies to my life, right? Do we have multiple resources? Do we have breaks? Do we build in reflection? So if a student is not understanding that rule, thus they're constantly breaking that rule, what's the barrier there? Have we had a conversation about that? So we need to think about that. And that's that, that's that emotional part of our brain, right? That's that center part of our brain that really wants the, un the emotional, the understanding of why we're doing it. Okay, then when we think about how we're presenting that information and how we're taking it in. Again, do we have multiple options? Do we have multiple forms of media, right? Are they, are they able to make those connections? Like I'm not grabbing food off people's plates. Here's why I'm not grabbing food off people's plates in the cafeteria. Oh, but wait, in my family, we do. How does that work, right? Are they making it connections to real life? So for example, if we're talking about, you know, um, well, in a restaurant, you wouldn't do that. If we're talking about cafeteria, 
Well, if 80% of our kids are socially, um, economically disadvantaged, maybe a restaurant isn't the best example because maybe they really don't go to restaurants. So how is how are they gonna understand and make that connection? Okay, and then for that executive functioning, that frontal lobal part of our brain, right? Think about, do we have images for our text too, for our kids to make sure that they have that picture that also connects to those words? Do we have it in digital? Do we have multiple tools for them to show their knowledge? Pick a, pick a tool. And I don't, I'm not talking about necessarily um, electronic tools either. A right? uh, piece of paper and a pencil. Written or verbal responses. Do we have an agenda? Do we have a schedule? Do they understand it? Do they have their own goals that they are setting for themselves? We need to think about that as we start thinking about our PBIS and how it is going to be accessible for all of our students. Okay, so on the home-based document, you will see a little section that says barriers. I want you to now think about, as we were talking about barriers and I gave you some examples, I would like you to share your thoughts on that home base of where are you starting to see barriers in the learning, okay? Especially around PBIS. So if you're just starting your PBIS or maybe you're not there, you can, you can think of like a barrier within your context, right? So you're the manager of like Jennifer and Jennifer's really difficult and really wants to know why and have all the information presented to her at once. And it's a barrier when she doesn't get it, right? What's the barrier there? And, and maybe how could, how could we minimize that barrier? Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes to kind of write down some ideas and some barriers that you're already seeing in your context. Ah, uh, buy-in. Yes, anonymous gopher, buy-in. <laughs> right. So what's the barrier? What is stopping them from buying into it, right? What is what is the block? Is it because they don't really understand why we're doing it? I don't know. Right? And anytime something is new, that's just scary, right? When we make any kind of changes, it's like, oh, we're good, we're good. Okay. Oh, so how do we uh, how do we make time available for everybody to understand the training? Yeah, it's a systems issue, huh? We got systems issues all over the place. Oh, restorative justice. Oh, uh, restorative practices. Circles make them feel very vulnerable. So how do we build those circles to feel more like a community, so they don't feel vulnerable? I love it. Ah, parent family engagement. Yes, absolutely. Oh, it's hard to kill the sacred cloud. <laughs> that is so true, right? I've done it for years this way. What's the problem with that? Mind shift, right? Mind shift. Yeah. Yeah. So really, we got to start thinking about what's the barrier? What is stopping them? from really wanting to do this. What, what's the holdup? Yeah, nice, you guys, nice. I love it, I love it. All right, so now we are going to move into restorative practices. Okay, so our next, our next and last segment for today is gonna to be on restorative practices and how we designed, as Jennifer mentioned earlier, is we wanted for this first session because everyone's gonna be at different places. So to kind of give an overview of restorative practices, an overview of PBIS and UDL, and then we're gonna really dive deeper into the alignment piece in the next uh, sessions. So, so again, this is you know restorative practices through the International Institute of Restorative Practices where I received my training. Uh, the typical two day, it's a typical two day training. So we're doing in 20 minutes. 
So do the best I can, but I'm just going to highlight the cornerstone pieces of restorative practices. And then next time, again, we will look at the alignment between the three. So I'm going to not show the video. It's only like four minutes, but this is from the International Institute of Restorative Practices. It, it gives an overview of restorative practices, but it really is, as it says here, an emerging social science. It's really about the science of relationships. So how is it that we're building community and building relationships with students, with staff, with our families? And would anyone, so we have uh, some different voices in the room, would anyone mind reading what are restorative practices? I can. Thank you, Tina. Uh, restorative practices are a framework for building community and for responding to challenging behavior through authentic dialogue, coming to understanding and making things right. Okay, great. And just a myth buster, I think a lot of times when we think of, or sometimes we think of restorative practices, that even the word itself, restore, is to fix, right? To fix something. But 80% of restorative practices is that proactive piece, that building that sense of community. And then 20% of restorative practices is that responding, responding to uh, ch behaviors and challenges when those arise. Yeah, thank you. So just some outcomes of restorative practices. Again, I the one that really resonates that, that's that 80% is building the healthy relationships between educators and students, but we're also looking at reducing and preventing harmful behavior. And when harm does happen, how are we restoring those po positive relationships? And how are we dealing with conflict um, and bringing students back into the community uh, when harm has happened? and then addressing those needs of the school community. I also want to point out that this restorative in its restorative practices of, is a very Western construct and acknowledging that restorative practices have been around for a very long time through indigenous communities um, throughout the world. International Institute of Restorative Practices really got their curriculum from the Maori people of New Zealand. And it's for indigenous communities, it's, it's a way of being. It's, it's how, how are we relating and being in the world? And so uh, I just really want to acknowledge that, that uh, we've kind of coined, Western construct has coined the phrase restorative practices, but it really has roots in indigenous communities. All right, so would anyone else mind reading what's the fundamental hypothesis of restorative practices? Human uh, beings are happier. Oh, sorry. Someone else want to go. You're good, Julie. Thanks. Very much. Human beings are happier, more productive, and more likely to make positive changes in their behavior when those in positions of authority do things with them rather than to them or for them. Great. Thank you. So this real shift, I think, in kind of discipline practices or maybe old school practices, and some it's still existing of doing things to people, kind of that punitive piece. Whereas in the, looking at restorative, we're looking at doing things with people. So it's not to say that there's not consequences for your behavior, but how is it that when students, for example, makes a poor choice, how is it that we are bringing that student back into the community and reintegrating them back in as part of our community? We can go ahead and switch to the next. So one of the cornerstones of restorative practices is the social discipline window. And so if you look on the left side, there is the axes of control. And control, limit setting, discipline, having high expectations, that would fall under that control. And at the bottom is the support. So from low to high, right? So encouragement, nurture, love. And if we look at the top left box, and then think about for a second, and some of you are very familiar with this, and for those that are new, that's a um, just learning more about what the social discipline window um, is all about. So if you were in the top left box and you had high control, so the, think of if you were a fly on the wall in a classroom, high control, super high in control, low in support, what would that 
look like, sound like, feel like, and you can unmute your and just popcorn out. You can put it in the chat. But what would that what would that feel like look like in a classroom that was high control but very low support? Thinking very strict in a very quiet classroom. Mm -hmm. Very strict. Thank you, Greg. Very good. Uh, quiet, you can be scared, very few choices for students. You be afraid to take a um, risk or to fail. Uh-huh, yep, you feel like they're gonna fail. Punitive, authoritarian, right. So the social discipline window and go, we just click once, Jen. Okay. So that's, yes, yeah. so if you're high in control, and low in support, that's in the restorative social discipline window, it's doing things to people, the punitive box. So if we look at the bottom right-hand corner and say you're in a classroom, a fly on the wall, high high support, like super high in support, super encouraging, nurturing, um, caring, but very low control. What would that, again, in the chat or uh, unmute, what would that look like, sound like, feel like? Kids running wild. Yes, yep. <laughs> kids running wild. Very permissive. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Yes. So yeah, let's go ahead and reveal that box. And that's right. You're doing things for people, right? The permissive. And then think about the fly on the wall in a, a classroom that's very low in both. So low control, low in support. What would that, again, if you want to unmute or... Put in the chat, what's that gonna look like, sound like, feel like? Chaos, yeah. Kind of think of it as a teacher that might have their like ready to retire, feet up on the desk and just checked out. Can be one. Mm -hmm. All right, Jen, go ahead and reveal that, thank you. So that's the not box that's neglectful. And then what we wanna strive to be is in, within the restorative window, is in that high control, high support. So if you're in a classroom that's high in control and high in support, what would that look like, sound like, and feel like? Safe. Mm -hmm. Yep, balanced and comfortable. Kids are engaged in questioning, clear expectations. Mm -hmm. You know, those classrooms where it can be, it can be noisy, it can be loud, kids are moving, but the teacher has that control and able to get them back, right? We have, has, they have those clear expectations. Great, excellent. Let's go ahead and reveal. So that is doing things with people and that's that restorative box. So just want to also, that we're human and it's, oh, we want to strive to be in the with box. So let's say I had a really hard morning, right? And I come into work and I'm in that two box. Uh, moving from being implicit, like we all implicit moving to like, oh, I'm not feeling not feeling great about this to moving to be more explicit. I can be aware of how I'm you know, reflecting, oh, I'm feeling more in the punitive box. How can I shift to be more restorative? Uh, there's also times when it's not, it's totally appropriate to be in the two box. If there's a fire drill, I am not going to gather everybody in a circle to say, how do we feel about lining up to go outside, right? So some, you know, we move around these boxes, but with, with being explicit in our practices, how is it that we can shift to be more within the with box? And then this is just a nice kind of visual reminder. <laughs> so high control, high support, breakfast club, low support, low control, and that four box, the bad teacher. Uh, movie with Cameron Diaz and then Hagrid he was very high in support and uh, low in control and then Karate Kid right with a uh, high uh, high control and high support okay so I'm gonna sh I'm gonna we are gonna go into a quick I'm aware of the time but just for a few minutes but um, I'm gonna change the I'm gonna drop a question into the chat because we don't have time to go deeply into that activity so just give me a second. So just for a few minutes, 
um, hold on. Okay. So when you think about the social discipline window, what is resonating with you about it? Why is it important to strive to be in the with box of having that high control and high support? So thinking about your setting um, and, and what's working at your site, maybe there's a lot of times that we are working and you're, you see your site working in that social discipline window and that restorative with box. And then how is it that we can shift and maybe even strive to be more in it by what changes or what barriers are in the way um, that are preventing us to do that. Okay. And then we got, all right, so we'll go ahead and do a, a few minutes in the breakout rooms. All right, looks like we're all back. And so just one last thing we'll cover with the restorative practices is the looking at the restorative practices continuum. And so as I mentioned before, how 80% is that proactive piece. And so if you move along this continuum, it moves from informal to formal. And so if you're on the informal side, it's gonna take less people, less time, less resources. And as you move along the continuum, it's gonna be more st structured, responsive, more people, more time, more resources. That formal conference is a whole other, train. there's restorative practices training and that's restorative justice for the formal conferencing. And we'll go into more components of restorative practices, but just briefly that effective statements are brief comments about how others were impacted by the person's behavior. So how, how do I feel based on someone's behavior? For example, that could be a positive, it could be a negative. Like I really like the, for example, I really like the way Johnny walked into the classroom. He shows me he's ready to learn. That would be an example of effective statement. And then effective questions that take it one step further. And there is a series of questions that you moved th through with a student to ask you know, who was affected, how they were affected and they um, how how is it that we can make things right, and then small and um, impromptu conversations occur when a few people meet briefly to address and resolve a problem or a conflict, and then circles. And someone mentioned it before, if about it's really important with circles that you really start with those that proactive piece of building that sense of community because if we jump in to responding when something happened and we don't have that sense of community built that's going to be it, it could be a challenge because students might not feel as safe to be a part of those circles and then the formal conferences conference as i mentioned is more when harm someone has um, caused harm and we're bringing them back into the community and there's a process to go through for that formal conference piece All right. So Jen, do you want to go ahead and take this sure. last section? Absolutely. So before we wrap up, we have five minutes left. So I'm going to ask you to do two things. In the chat, I would like you to write down one connection that you've made today between UDL restorative practices and PBIS. And then the second part is whoop, survey. Please fill out the survey because it will support us in our next session. Okay, so two things. Patty will hopefully put the link to the survey in the chat, but it is also on the home base document. Is it also on these slides? And then, of course, what connections have you made so far today? Please, you can unmute too and share them out loud, or you can put them into the chat. We are very flexible either way. Someone said the with part, both of all of these really are engagement based mm -hmm. and focused on support. Yeah, and the survey, there's no freak out over the survey. It's like three quick questions. Clear expectations, consistency and implementation. And uh, the connection between UDL restorative practices and PBS is that they all support students with being active participants in their learning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
relationship building. Yeah. Janine, I like how you said too, with the community schools project happening with a lot of our, with a lot of our school districts this year. Yeah, that relationship is so key. It is so key. We're not going to learn from somebody if we don't have some kind of relationship with them. I mean, as a as a former high school teacher, you know, I can tell you I performed at my best when I felt like my administration understood me and listened to me versus administrators that didn't bother. Right. right. So it's right. it's a lot of that. Well, and then we talk about just like mind shift of adults, right? So a lot of this work all of us are doing is really about, um, you know, you have our champions of the work that carry it, but then it's like, how do we help shift the mindsets of the adults that are working in our schools too? Yeah, so. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That was one thing that we kind of um, looked at too, when we were looking at the barriers, a lot of them are um, adult barriers. It's not necessarily the kids can't access it, it's, it's the adults that, and so that's interesting. Well, and, and I think along those lines to further support what Janine and, and you were saying, Jennifer, is like the idea that we have to be really thoughtful when we ask people in the seats to do this work. We have to make sure it's part of a bigger plan, that they understand the why, that things go together, that there's sustainability, because there's nothing more frustrating than going through, you know, I mean, I went through UDL training years ago, and then like, we didn't have any support with it. So it's like, as much as I wanted to do it as a practitioner, as an educator, there was no system by which we were going to make this happen. And so you go, you're excited, you have this energy, and then it doesn't go anywhere. And so I think as as county office of ed, as school districts, we have to be really mindful in going slow to go fast so that when we roll out, for lack of a better term, um, that people do see that they go together and they all support mm -hmm. the sense of community, but that there is a plan. You can't just say, hey, come to this training. You can't just start PBIS and then no, don't have a plan for sustainability, right? And that I think that goes for all of these things. Yeah. Uh, and why they can take hold or they can sort of stop dead in their tracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I love every in the chat too, you guys have done a really good job with that idea of really having those connections in the support and having everybody be active participants and understanding that everybody is part of a school. A school is a community. And so how are we really building that sense of community and understanding that learning is emotional, right? Whether it's adult learning or student learning and, and how are we really going to you know, support that and have those I, clear expectations and goals, man. I'm like, even if I don't like the direction it's going, if I understand the goal of it, I still will do it, right? But if you're telling me this is what we're doing and I don't see why or the purpose of it, oh, it's really hard for me to like join in on the fun. I'm like, oh, heck no, you're not making me do that. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And that consistency. Yeah. Everybody's valued and they're seen and they're heard. Yes. I love it. All right, you guys, it is 430. So I appreciate you being here. Again, session two is coming up in November and we are going to talk about those school-wide expectations and routines and how we can use and utilize that UDL and restorative practices to make it rock and roll. All right. So if you have right, any thanks, questions, everyone. reach out. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you.